Let's talk about race. You know, you can't see the money can't be eaten. It's where you are. Lost along the way. Will you believe the history that assassins write? It's where you be. Once again. Check this out. Here's the escalator, world dominator, miseducator, boom to walk to the devil's lair. This virus of racist faces, contagious to all types of places. Gotta peel layers off, and it ain't gonna get done soft. Discussion can stave off the bussin', fussin', bum rushin'. Politicians filibusterin', ways to usher in. You genetic disruption won't terrorize those with open eyes, not dealing with fakes who just want to sit around and theorize meanwhile in the street another pair of police state hate related victimized eyes lay lifeless looking at concrete many topics many ways to drop it we get here the gi bill of rights so the gi bill and as it relates to the especially present sense of the black community is a very important economic issue so the gi bill was a bill that would allow for veterans of the united states military to benefit greatly in a lot of fields but especially education getting easier access to that and having that cost less and even more so than that, uh, easy access to housing loans and ownership of property that would be able to have a very strong foundation for uh, a family's economic future, even generations down the line. So when this bill was drafted, there was a great deal of fear that this would allow for Black advancement to happen too rapidly because Black people could, like every other citizen, volunteer for the United States military. And so there are very specific parameters and stipulations put in place that would allow for the benefits that were supposed to be guaranteed by the GI Bill to skip over the uh, benefits and the uh, advancements of Black soldiers. Redlining in the GI Bill is something that goes very, very closely together. So the term redlining comes from a common act on uh, drawing maps where you would put red lines around specific issues of, uh, or around specific uh, locations of uh, danger. In this case, of course, referring to locations that were primarily occupied by, uh, by uh, black citizens. So you would have these places be highlighted by red lines where you would be able to avoid benefiting these locations in regards to housing opportunities that would be developed there in regard to housing loans that could be offered to various locations there, et cetera, et cetera. And you would have areas that were primarily inhabited by white citizens be outlined in green where all of these benefits and things, uh, many of which are included under the... Uh, benefits offered to veterans by the GI Bill would be included in those greed lines. So to this day, the term redlining it pertains to that spirit, pertains to that aspect of highlighting and singling out areas of uh, Black communities and uh, separating them from benefits. So to continue on this point, you have further examples and you have further quotes of uh, these aspects of neighborhoods being drawn out, refusing to insure mortgages, refusing to, uh, refusing to subsidize builders that were trying to build things in these areas. And these would continue to 
take away from the potential benefits that black veterans could have if they had access to the same resources and the same guarantees that their white counterparts were. Not having access to these things didn't allow for a strong foundation or generational wealth. Whereas you could have gone into the American service as a, uh, as a lower class you know, uh, white man and come out with a great access to a housing loan with uh, great rates. And that would allow your family to have a strong foundation to continue to improve financially into the future, even long after that individual, you know, that's a World War II veteran's uh, time had passed. Without access to those things, you get a long and uh, strong understanding of where a lot of uh, the wage gap comes from. Okay, pause for a second. Yeah, that looked like it was a repeat of. Segregated education. So in the city of Boston, there is a particular history with segregation, both in terms of when it was commonplace throughout the country, in terms of separating black and white students from each other based on the foundations of having their facilities in which learning was co uh, committed in be uh, physically separated and when that was commonplace in law throughout the country till even long after the fact. It was something that was allowed by the Massachusetts Supreme Court and well into the modern era, well into the recent era, this was something that was continued to be practiced on a uh, de facto level, even if it was no longer as uh, enforced, certainly uh, nationwide and the de jure level. So the court case of Brown versus Board of Education was a Supreme Court case that really broke through this perception of separate but equal and allowed for there to be a collective place of learning and a collective place of social interaction between black and white people again. So it was the specific case that began to break down the rigidly emplaced standards for segregation in public schools and other government schools like that. So as I was saying, despite Brown versus Board and Education passing in 1954, this is a practice that would continue in Boston for over a decade later, over two decades later, where you would have a significant crisis come about in regards to how you could desegregate schools. When there was a specific push in the city of Boston, a court order in order to uh, begin to uh, integrate schools, the way in which this was done was by having kids that lived in black neighborhoods be bused from their neighborhoods so that they could attend school in white neighborhoods. And the backlash to this from the white citizenry was tremendous. It resulted in riots. It resulted in acts of terror being committed against children, intimidation, you know, stones and bottles and things like that thrown against windows of buses in order to intimidate these children and all sorts of horrid things in order to bring a stop to the fulfillment of this court order. This is something that would continue for a long time. This is something that would have to be endured by many families that tried to seek a better educational option for their students because obviously as is relatively common knowledge the term separate of e separate but equal was obviously never that and white schools always had access to better funds better books it's a better opportunity for education for children and so there was a great educational benefit to the busing process 
And so it was a tremendous fight in order to push through these waves of riots and terror that were happening against this process that was attempting to forcibly change the level of segregation that had persisted in Boston for all of these years. This is something that actually directly pertains to my history because my father was in elementary school during this very time period. He grew up in Roxbury where he was originally being bused to a school in Roslindale. And in this context, he personally faced a lot of these issues, a lot of this terror of this, these screaming, furious white people, these citizens that were expounding levels of anger that a, children, or a child could barely comprehend or understand why these things would be happening. So at the end of the day, it was something that my grandfather uh, wouldn't tolerate. And so he moved my father and uh, the rest of his siblings out of Roxbury and into the city of Cambridge where I was raised. And this is something that has directly, you know, played a part into why my life is the way it is, why I live in the city I live in, why I was raised where I was raised. And this is a, a part of the tales of history of how all of these things interconnect, how all of these things interplay with each other and lead to where they currently are. This is how we are where we are. Where are we today? So now, as we currently live through the coronavirus pandemic, ideally closer to the end than we are to the beginning, we have a particular trend to note of how disproportionately affected Black people are uh, to the coronavirus compared to white people. And you have lots of examples of severity in, uh, in suffering to this virus being caused by underlying medical conditions. You know, these things uh, range from diabetes to obesity to asthma, but these things aren't things that uh, people of African descent are inherently uh, uh, prone to, such as something like uh, anemia is something people of African descent are inherently prone to due to genetics. This isn't that at all. This is something that are based on uh, conditions. These are things that are based on situations like living in food deserts are a cause for obesity in the Black community. It's not an a inherent uh, genetic phenomenon. So all of the aspects that we've talked about, how you lead from one thing to another, how this leads to uh, community not having access to fresh fruit, uh, food or economic stimulus because of how it was redlined how something being redlined is based on uh, fears of economic development to, uh, from the GI Bill, how the treatment of black soldiers was based on laws of segregation with the Jim Crow laws and how those stem from the black codes and how those stem from the manners of release after uh, the freedom from slavery after the Civil War. All of these things are interconnected and we can truly see how the chain links interconnect when you get to the modern day. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about race. Let's talk about race.